2020s are going to be a decade of crisis, but also of opportunity for the Western world. It is when the perfect storm that has been gathering for decades will finally play out. The confluence of the broken financial system, massive unfunded liabilities, several debt crises, asset bubbles will join the pressures created by the ever-growing income inequality within society and the eradication of the middle class. This, in turn, will feed the ever-increasing radicalization and polarization within society as the transformation of the West via mass migration will no longer be theoretical or be able to be ignored. And none of this takes into account the dwindling amount of non-renewable resources, environmental pressures, and the continued explosion of population in the developing world, as well as other factors that will, without doubt, add even more pressure and more tension on an already combustible civilization. Put simply, the 2020s are going to be chaotic, economically, socially, and politically, with both sides of the Atlantic facing roughly similar crises, albeit with very different variables. The question remains, how will this perfect storm be dealt with? And more to the point, will the current form of globalization, which has wrought many of these crises to a head, be continued in its current form? Or will the nationalist stirrings being expressed throughout the Western world today come to the forefront in the 2020s? Before this video starts, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to this channel, of course, if you like this kind of content. Also, if you are already subscribed, please check to see that you are still subscribed, as YouTube regularly unsubscribes people from channels like this. Also, please like, comment, and share this video on your own social media to help the channel grow and reach a new audience. Thank you very much in advance for this, and let's get started. Canada's current gaffe-prone Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, has stated that his nation is the world's first post-national state, a country with no culture to maintain or integrate into, that it is a template for the Western world going forward, and that the forces of globalism are unstoppable. Globalist proponents like Trudeau believe that the nation-states, like Canada, are not only obsolete, but they are a hindrance to the newly emerging global order. Globalism has been driven by technological advancement, via financial institutions and the mass media they own, by the internet, travel, commerce, trade, and of course, migration. But what kind of globalization is the real question going forward, especially with an economic system that demands endless growth on a finite planet as it crashes into the social and cultural ramifications of growing inequality, evaporation of social cohesion, and the apprehension within society that something is going terribly, terribly wrong. And it's for these reasons that there are those that are slandered by the political class, reviled by the financial class, and demonized by the mainstream media that they own, that posit nationalism at its core to be currently the most stabilizing political force that exists against globalization, as it speaks to our human sense of community and belonging, and that far from disappearing, it is resurging throughout most of the Western world despite being constantly vilified by an increasingly nervous elite in response to their gross mismanagement of globalization. Nationalism as expressed in the form of the US election of 2016, as well as the vote for the United Kingdom to leave the EU are the clearest examples of the rising rejection of globalism by the unwashed masses. In fact, there is rising tide of rejection in much of the West, not only to the economic dislocation that is being caused by a world dependent upon global supply chains, but also and especially the cultural and social upheavals caused by mass unrelenting immigration. And something important needs to be said here. 
that globalism as a paradigm championed by the Western political, financial, and media elite that comes complete with open borders and the free flow of capital without restriction is a paradigm shared by no human civilization, including the West, where it is most earnestly being foisted upon. And that is an important point, because nationalism within a global context is not even a question. In the countries that make up East Asia, the planet's other economic powerhouse region, you'll not hear in 10, 20, or even 100 years of any kind of political union between countries like China, Japan, or South Korea. The idea is so ludicrous to any that understand the antagonistic relations between these countries. Yes, most likely you will see more trade agreements and perhaps associations, but nationalism and the retention of sovereignty will remain a potent force in the Far East, which is again the global geopolitical and economic counterweight for decades and decades to come, barring something such as an alien invasion. And thus the question arises, how does the Western world, which is at the center of globalization, that seems to be struggling on how to integrate globalism with nationalism, how does it proceed? The question then arises, how does the Western world, which is at the center of the current form of open borders and unlimited freedom of capital globalization proceed, as it is being met with a perfect storm of social, environmental and political crises in the coming 2020s? The UK was the only large country within the EU that was consistently and constantly pushing for it to expand and liberalize. An EU in the absence of London's influence will have the opposite effect and will most likely harden the continent, and it will slide toward parochialism and fossilization. And in this regard, the UK is not to be taken as part of this presentation, but will in fact be the focus of a future video somewhere down the road. At the moment, most of the EU's financial business is centered on the City of London, while some of the EU's financial business will most likely relocate voluntarily, most will not. The EU may attempt to force relocation using regulatory means, but given the special status of the city, this will be a losing battle. Because much like the economic crisis and stagnation that is crippling much of the EU, but in particular the southern periphery nations of Greece, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, the EU seems incapable of finding a solution to the migrant crisis. And this is deemed by many not only the reason for the exit of the UK from the bloc, but the single most divisive issue within and between member states. And many state that the attempt to force many of the states in Eastern Europe by France and Germany to accept more migrants could prove to destabilize the bloc even further. And so the 2020s in the EU look to be set by social and demographic pressures that will increase social tensions and stress already strained social services. Also, the continued refusal to understand the root and cause, let alone talk about it, terrorism will continue to plague Western Europe in the near to foreseeable future. And like the streets of France, the increased militarization of cities across Western Europe in response will be that much more visible in the 2020s. But here is the important point that is almost taboo to state openly. Much of this doesn't matter as globalism is driven not by the wishes of the majority, but rather by one economic class, the financial elite, who are insulated to the social unrest their policies cause. The financial class have relentlessly also used the mass media that they own to dull down the populace and also promulgate cultural narratives that help suit their goals. Going into the 2020s look to ever more repressive laws, new speech and hate crime laws, censorship and other legal and social penalties that will inevitably arise in an attempt to control the social and economic tensions that are simmering just beneath the surface within Western Europe 
that only look to worsen. In fact, over the past decade, in many countries within the EU, people are being told repetitively by their national mass media as well as by their own governments that they as a people do not and have never, in fact, existed. Europe, because of demographic pressures, the collapse of cultural cohesion, the fumbling bureaucracy of the EU, looks to be evolving toward a neo-feudalistic dystopian future. It is, however, at these times, when internal as well as external conflicts arise, that can and historically have had a halting effect on the geopolitical forces that are pushing this form of globalism currently in Europe as well as the rest of the Western world. We are seeing this rejection of globalism across the continent, with the vote for Brexit to the rise of nationalist parties in some of the most dystopian societies on the continent, such as Sweden, there is a concerted pushback and rejections of policies that have normalized the use of hand grenades on the streets of Stockholm. These sentiments are propelled by stagnant wages coupled with higher costs of living, adding to a deteriorating social environment that has people looking to the past for solutions. Globalism in its current form is now only supported by financial elites, their owned media, a portion of the political class long ago bought off, and a shrinking number of ideological zealots that demand open borders. But the silent majority are beginning to find their voice and increasingly they are turning to national parties that reject the current incarnation of globalism. Without question, without doubt, the crisis that Europe is experiencing today will only intensify in the coming decade, but how it will play out is not as easy to forecast. But one thing is certain. People are beginning to demand from their corrupt political class a different way. The question being, however, will enough people be able to wake up in time to right the course of their countries before calamity? The United States also faces many of the same problems. Massive debt, both public and private. A shaky banking system built on privatizing profits and socializing losses. A government and mass media that has lost all semblance of legitimacy on both the proverbial right and left. And an increasingly polarized society. I think a better and more apt description, like in most of the West, in the United States, there are those that are for the current iteration of globalism and those that consider themselves patriots. Similar to Europe, the United States has seen vast numbers of people arriving on its shores, and like Europe, it is rapidly changing the demographics of the country. However, unlike in Europe, those arriving mostly from Mexico and Latin America are not only better educated, with some 95% of the people arriving being literate, but are in fact much more culturally compatible with the existing population. If immigration could be reduced for a time and newcomers be allowed to integrate, the American creed has had a long history of bringing disparate peoples together. But no matter how strong the American creed has been in the past, given current trends, the US does face the significant and real possibility of evolving into a bilingual English and Spanish nation. Using the example of Canada and Belgium as warnings, both countries have intractable challenges and unique problems that can and are avoided if all of the country's citizens are able to communicate in one common language. While the great emancipator Lincoln warned that a house divided against itself cannot stand, or thereabouts, in a speech given in 1858, it would seem that the forces of globalism have wrought the same damage and sown the same divisions to the body politic in the United States as it has elsewhere. As can be observed by the stormtroopers of globalism, the self-styled hashtag resistance, like their peers in the UK that have already demonstrated with the rejection of referenda that they do not respect the outcomes of democratic elections. So as the state of Texas passes from purple to blue, the tribalization of US elections based on transforming demographics will be complete. 
adding to both bankrupt cities, counties, and states, along with the Californiaization of the country, economically and socially, the 2020s look to be a decade of crisis in the United States. But a few things to consider. Materially, the United States is in the best position globally. It is the only country in the world with both food and energy security, backed up by the ability to project power globally. It's also the least exposed to the global economy of major industrial powers as a percentage of GDP, and thus, currently, it can engage and win trade wars with more ease than any near-peer nation or group of nations. Most certainly, America is being harried from without, but more serious challenges come from within. Income inequality, debt, but most of all, the tribalization of society via radicalizing globalist-derived ideologies, as well as the transforming demographics of the country, will be a serious set of issues to contend with going forward. In terms of nationalism versus globalism, countries in the East are already very comfortable operating in the global system while retaining full sovereignty within their nation states. It's in the West where the hiccups arise, and these hiccups in Western Europe have grown into a cancer as the continent seems incapable of managing the social, demographic, economic, and financial waves of globalism within an EU framework, and thus the rise of nationalism across the continent. While the US is obviously much better positioned than Europe, a continent country insulated by oceans with food and energy independence and backed up by the US Navy, it too is grappling with the symptoms of globalism. And none of this takes into account the degradation of the environment, the depletion of non-renewable resources that is occurring, or outside problems and contagions that are now, as yet, unknowable that can and will arise in the near future. Whatever the case may be, the 2020s are shaping up to be a decade where the crises that have been fomenting, brewing, and building for years will finally come to a head. How they are handled will set the course for the rest of the century. While in many ways things might look bleak, things are always darkest before the dawn. And it is for those reasons that the decade ahead should not bring a sense of dread to you or anyone watching this video, but one of opportunity. Our destiny is in our hands, and we can shape it any way we like.